This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Part of the reason where analysis of the data is very difficult, when you go through the papers which are addressing their results with treating central venous obstructions and occlusions, you're never quite sure exactly what level they're treating at, what method they're doing, or what type of follow-up is being performed. So if this gets out there, I think it would be extremely important. I've been tasked with talking about technical tips in crossing the uh, occluded central vein. Now, you know, these technical tip talks, it's, I don't know, it, it's, it's pretty much someone's going to tell them, you know, I'm going to tell you what I know how to do. That doesn't mean that this is the cat's meow and the best way to do it. And I've always been under the um, impression that people do what they do on a regular basis best. So. You know, I'm going to present some things, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to work in your practice. And I would encourage and endorse people adopting the strategies that they're most familiar with, because that makes it easy to recognize when something's gone wrong. And that does happen. The four things that come to mind in this uh, realm are treating, is treatment indicated? Is it safe? Is it possible? And once you've answered the first three questions, then you could say, well, how am I going to do it? Let's start with, is it indicated? Well, that's kind of a funny question, isn't it? That somebody's got an occlusion, you would figure, ah, maybe we better fix it. There was an interesting paper that came out of the University of Pennsylvania maybe a decade ago. And uh, Scott Tratola is the guy who works out there. And they do a lot of dialysis work. They had 35 patients with 86 central venous stenosis and occlusions. And of these, they didn't treat 24 of them. They were dealing with a peripheral dialysis access problem. They observed it and decided, you know, not to address the central issue. There were another um, 86 lesions, and 62 were treated in this group. And of these people who were treated and not treated, a certain number of them got follow-up venograms. Interestingly enough, of the uh, 24 lesions which were not treated, 12 patients underwent repeat venography down the line. You figure there's something wrong with their axis again. And of these central venous lesions, 12 of them, four were improved, four were stable, and four had progressed without any treatment whatsoever. And no patient progressed to have symptoms or occlusion if they were presenting with a stenosis. Okay. So maybe it's a, not as a malignant thing as people have been led to believe. In the treated group, there were 62 lesions, and there were 26 follow-up venograms of the patients that, that they treated. And of those, their, um, the treated lesion progressed to arm swelling in one, additional stenosis in four, and something that required a stent placement in four. And look at the amount of progression of the 26 lesions that were treated. That makes you think that treating these lesions may not be a real clever thing. Because I think we're all uh, used to the fact that if you put a stent in, it's going to look great on day one. But you know, three, six months later, it's going to come back. And it's not going to look so good. And it's not going to be such an easy problem to treat. So my take on this is you don't have to treat all of these lesions. And Dr. Harlan's going to be talking about getting access in these patients following my talk. But if you have an access and it's working, and you can identify a problem peripheral, an outflow stenosis, then I think that lesion ought to be treated. And if there is a plausible explanation of why the axis malfunction, I would encourage you to leave the central venous stenosis or occlusion alone in that patient group. So let's talk about the next thing in occlusions particularly. Is it safe? Is it safe? Well. 
I'll tell you, a lot of it's safe, but it's not completely safe. And here's a patient who has an occlusion of the proximal aspect of the superior vena cava, giant azagous collateral going down. The patient had an SVC syndrome, big fat face, and you know, just using guide wire and catheter techniques, able to get down in through the atrium, down into the cava, go back here, we're going forward, uh, blow up a balloon, and lo and behold, when you inject, you see extravasation. It's going into the pericardium. And a covered stent was placed pretty expeditiously, but despite that, it's a big hit for somebody. And if you're in shock for a while and you, know, you don't have good physiology to begin with, this is a life-threatening situation. And despite this, you know, the patient did end up dying because of this procedure. And the problem is the pericardial reflection. I think that the Mason-Dixon line of this is the azagous vein. If you're above the origin of the azagous vein, it's really pretty safe. You know, you can get a perforation, extravasation, but most of the time you're not going to get a big mediastinal hematoma and you're not going to get a hemothorax. Once you get below where the insertion of the azagous vein here, which is generally in, uh, right at the confluence of the brachiocephalic veins, it puts the pericardium in play. Pericardium in play is a bad thing. And once you start extravasation into the pericardium, it gets to be a very sticky issue. Moreover, you know, you think, well, you know, if I got, I'll just put a covered stent and it's going to be okay. Stents in the heart, not good. Not good. Wall stents in the heart, almost universally lethal. So it's not the easy bailout that, you know, we were hoping it would have. Is it possible? Hey, Tom. Well, <laughs> You might think you can figure out if it's possible or not. This is somebody who was suffering, you know, we had one of these dialysis catheters going through an hepatic vein through the liver. Great situation. A lot of fun to place. So I'm not sure it's really the most comfortable thing to do. And it's generally a, a last resort sort of thing. But she was having trouble with it, kept coming out, and we're trying to figure out what to do. So we got the CT scan. CT scan shows that both the IJs are out, you know, we have venograms to show this. But the remarkable thing is there is dense calcification coming down the right brachiocephalic vein and really extending through the whole length of the superior vena cava. Luckily, I have partners because I, I told these guys that this was impossible. This, this really couldn't be done. It was ridiculous to try. But I have a, a nice, young, bright, aggressive, extremely talented partner, Dr. Coley, and he wanted to take it on. And sure enough, he got in there and was able to wiggle just with catheter and guide wire techniques, seeing the string side, and eventually got a wire down there aligned for the placement of a hero graft. And, you know, that worked for a while. It was very beneficial to place. And my take on this is if that case is possible based on the CT, you cannot tell if something's impossible. So I would encourage you to try if it seems to be a reasonable thing to do. Finally, the meat of the talk, which is just a short segment, are on technical tricks. These are the things that I do when I'm crossing venous obstructions. I use a coaxial system to get maximal support. I inject frequently. I'm looking for the string side, and I really want to know when I'm out. If you're out, you've got to know because you don't want to make big holes going into the mediastinum. That's no good. You always try to capture any kind of territory that you gain during the war. So if you get the guide wire down through the occlusion, try to advance your sheaths into a position to provide you additional support in order to successfully cross the lesion. If you can't do it with a guide wire, you can consider sharp recanalization, but know exactly where you are because this has some risk to it. And certainly if you're good with intravascular ultrasound, this can be extremely helpful because you can see what you're doing. And here's a couple of examples. Here's a patient that had uh, subclavian occlusion. This was actually leading to a chylothorax because the insertion of the uh, right duct was going up there in the patient's thorax. They really wanted this opened up if possible. I didn't know if it would do any good. But notice in order to do this, what we like to do is have a large sheet, maybe in the order of a nine or 10 that has some support, and through that a six French sheet, through that a five French catheter, and then through the five French catheter you can use a microcatheter. And if you use coaxial systems like that, they do provide substantial support that you can push and you can even obviously make holes and things if you want but sooner or later you can get to your desired target in the majority of cases. The string side, 
When you're at an impasse, try to get a catheter down there and inject, and often you'll see a little trail of contrast. Certainly if there's a lot of collaterals, it can be confusing and you have to separate what is the spring sign that's showing the dissection plane through the occluded vein that will allow the passage of the guide wire. And once you get, as I said before, once you've gained any kind of territory, put the sheath down there. Save that. Capture it because that will allow you enough support to complete the procedure. Now, how about sharp recanalization? Sure, we do do it sometimes. What's, there's a lot of gizmos out there that vendors provide. My personal favorite, particularly if I'm dealing with an upper superior vena cava, is not to use anything very fancy. I like to get all of the sheets up there, the large nine, with the six inside it, with the five through it, and then a microcatheter. And through the microcatheter, I just put the back end of an 018 wire, uh, sometimes the heavier 018 wires that go through. They're reasonably sharp, and generally with that much support, you can advance them through. When you're in the mediastinum, go lateral, go anterior. Use th orthogonal projections. You don't want to be going medial. You don't want to be going posterior. That's where the bad things live. And in most circumstances, if you advance the back end of a V18 wire through the wall of something and follow it with the microcatheter, you can pull the wire out and put the soft end of the wire through, capture it with a loop snare, creating a through and through or body floss aspect, and then you can <coughs> blow up balloons or do whatever you want to create it. Interestingly, many times if it's a short segment occlusion, you do not require a stent. Stents currently, in my mind, they just start the clock ticking. If you put in a stent, it'll look great the first time it's done, and sometimes there's a bailout and you have to do it. But in the end, that will fail, and they usually will fail within a year. Uh, there are other things that it you have. We have long Chiba needles. Uh, these uh, ones that we generally use can be 65 centimeters long. Now, if you're going from the groin and you want to work up, Eh, 65 is sort of on the border. It may make it or it may not. This is an excellent device to use in the subclavians. The good thing about a Chiba needle, it's quite sharp. It will accept an 018 wire. So if you do successfully cross and you can inject some contrast to see, you can advance the wire and pretty much you'll be successful after that. There are other things though. Uh, the Roshi Shida tip set. Again, not long enough to reach from the groin. Can be used from the above. You have to have the arms straight because they're relatively stiff. Steerable cannula, you can make sure you're going anterior using this device. Uh, there was a paper by Goo where they uh, recanalized 33 of 35 central venous occlusions using this device with no complications. Again, you know, going back to Bart's analysis of the situation, it was hard to tease out where the locations were, how many were brachycephalic, if any were uh, superior cable. They had no obstructions. In contradistinction, there was a paper by Arabi in 2015 where they were using the transeptal needle. The transeptal needle will reach. It will go high enough. But, you know, it's a pretty large device. You've got a 17-gauge needle, and it will make a hole. In that series of seven patients, they had two patients with major complications, including hemothorax and uh, pericardial tamponade. So, you know, that's not the kind of endorsement that makes me run a run out. I've never used it, but uh, I've used lots of tip sets. Then, if you know you're used to using the Outback catheter or the uh, RF wire, that's what you should use because these things have both been shown to be effective in treating these types of occlusions. And finally, if you're familiar and used to using the IVUS, you should use it because it'll let you know where it is. In that one case that I showed you where we placed the hero graph, it was very easy to see that we were knocking on the door of the occlusion because we had an IVUS probe coming from above showing exactly where we were going to enter the brachycephalic vein. But as you guys know, if you're not used to using IVUS, doing a tough case is probably not the best place to break it out. Thank you very much for your attention. I really appreciate it.